and turn me to Revelation, the last book of the Bible, in chapter 1. And it's probably the most neglected New Testament book. Now, I've heard a lot of people say to me, I haven't had enough courage to preach through Revelation. Maybe it is also because people themselves have different views, but I suspect that it's for two reasons. First, it is complex and mysterious. It's full of strange metaphors, bizarre beasts, symbolic numbers, laden with rich allusions to the Old Testament and to its imagery. And quite often as a result, for the casual reader in 2024, let us be honest, it can be at, diff at times difficult to understand. We give it a try, we do not get too far. We scratch our heads in perplexity and wish that he was preaching from Mark's Gospel again. But there's one reason, that's one reason why I think Revelation is neglected. But another has to do with the strange fascination that it seems to hold for some. And uh, I can't think of a real kind way, but maybe people who be slightly wonky on the prophecy side. And uh, they're always drawing tribulation timelines, fighting the identity of the Antichrist in every political candidate every few years, or you know, the Arabian terrorists, and they stock up on canned goods for the days of Armageddon. And uh, I've come across a few there. And they're souls who are afflicted by paranoia, and they're given to conspiracy theories. And some approaches to interpreting the book of Revelation makes it a roadmap to the future in a way that seems to baptise that species of end times delusion. Um, there's a whole series of books called Left Behind, and it was a novel, but it was of what happened, you know, people on an aeroplane and the, and, the, and the pilot's no longer there. But in my experience at least, most of them have an instinct that that cannot be the right approach to the book. But as often as not, these are the only folks that we know who claim to understand the book of Revelation. And so we simply avoid the book altogether, perhaps for fear that I will be looking like they do. So we swing between two extremes. Either we find it so difficult that we never read it, or we find that those who say they understand it so difficult that we don't want to be like them. But either way, I firmly believe Revelation has been underread, undertaught, misused, misunderstood, fatally misinterpreted, especially in contemporary evangelicalism for many years. And I believe that the widespread phobia toward Revelation is a tragic mistake, and I think that the Church of Jesus Christ is the poorer for it. And it was written towards the end of the first century by John, John the Gospel writer, and it's a book for the whole church in every age, beginning with the generation living at the time of its writing. It's not a volume of future history giving us encrypted messages about international politics and global war. It is not a coded communique from the heavenly command control centre, allowing only those who know the code to understand world events as they are reported each day on the news. It's a series of pictures, of graphic images, designed to convey in glorious technicolour and in three dimensions the fact that Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord. That Jesus Christ is Lord in the church and Jesus Christ is Lord in the world. And one of the reasons why John Bunyan's Pilgrim's Progress is so enduringly popular, perennially effective in communicating the Christian Gospel is because it communicates those truths in picture form. I know a lot of parents have read Pilgrim's Progress at some point or not other to their children. Sid was telling me that Judah's quite scared at the moment because I don't know where he is in that. But I mean, you often come across it, parents reading their children Pilgrim's Progress. And, what it, and Revelation portrays gospel truths for us in picture form. It's the word of Christ to a suffering, persecuted church and it's explained, though tears may last for the night, joy cometh in the morning. That though satanic power 
may seem to prevail in the world today, Jesus Christ is seated on his throne as victor today. Satan is bound and his cause shall triumph gloriously. And Revelation should encourage us. Revelation is a trumpet blast to use one of the images of the book itself, that Christ is Lord, that we should stand firm in the evil day, and having done it all, to stand. And it reminds us, as the closing exhortations to the seven churches in chapters 2 and 3 say, that we will overcome, that we will persevere, and we will conquer through him who has loved us. So it's a book, the message of which we must hear, and see in our mind's eyes more urgently than ever before, that as we face as a church, as this church faces, as the, as the faithful church of Jesus Christ faces across the world, cultural marginalisation, social e exclusion, economic sanction, and in many places right now today, brothers and sisters are being physically persecuted for the sake of the gospel. And it lifts our eyes to the heavenly throne room so that we, with John, like in Revelation 4 verse 2, behold a throne and we see the one who is seated on there. The one that we've been singing about, the one that we prayed about, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And it's for the comfort and the encouragement of all our hearts. This afternoon I briefly want to look at verse, the first 11 verses of chapter 1 and uh, you can divide it up into a few ways. You could have just done verse 1, you could have just done verse three, the first three verses. I'm going to the first 11 verses because I believe it functions as John's introduction to the book. So let's read it together, Revelation 1 verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants the things that must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear, who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who was and is and who, who was, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. John, I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, Write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus, to Smyrna, to Pergamon, to Thyatira, to Sardis, to Philadelphia, and to Laodicea. Thank the Lord that he's spoken in the reading of his holy and inerrant word. So why would we, a few of us this, this evening, spend our precious Sundays examining this obscure volume of ancient Near Eastern apocalyptic literature? What an odd thing to do. Well, there are four themes in the first 11 verses that I help think help us answer that question, why we would be here. Number one, verses one to three, it's a word of blessing. That's quite clear. It's a word of blessing. Sometimes you'll get an opening sermon on a series of revelation on the word it's a blessing from the first three verses. Verses four and five, they're two verses, is a word of grace. So they're four words. So there's a word of blessing in the first three verses. There's a word of grace in the fourth and fifth verse, in verses six to eight, the three verses there, it's a word of praise. And the last three verse, the last two, three verses, nine to eleven, it's a word of encouragement. So it's blessing, grace, praise, 
encouragements. And whatever your approach to Revelation might be, whatever details about God's unfolding program for human history you might glean or think you can glean from its pages, if those four things are not happening, you've missed the point. Blessing, grace, praise, encouragement. If those four gifts are not taking root in your heart as you read Revelation, you're reading it wrong. So first of all, it's a word of blessing. The first three verses. The burden of the message of Revelation and then the blessing that message conveys, the nature of the book and its effect in our lives, and they're linked together is cause and effect. Notice what we're told about the nature and the burden of the message of Revelation. It is, verse 1, you know it well, but it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So here is the glory of the book. It's the glory of the whole Bible. It is not about history. It is not about the future. Although it has things to say about both. It isn't about you. It's not about the church. Neither is it about the world, though it teaches us a great deal about both. It's not about heaven. It's not about hell. Although there is teaching on both subjects in the book. It's about Jesus. It says so. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And that word revelation in the original language means unveiling. It's the unveiling of Jesus Christ. It is the display of Jesus. So right up front, that's where John wants us to rivet our attention. Not on the dragon, not on the beasts, but on Jesus. He wants you to see Christ in new ways and with greater clarity. So Revelation is about Jesus. And John says it is a book about the things that must soon take place. Now it reappears in one form or another in several places in Revelation and it comes from Daniel 2 verse 28 which says that there is a God in heaven and he's revealed to Nebuchadnezzar what must take place in the latter days. In Revelation it's the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to show what must take place, what must soon take place. So the latter days from Daniel are replaced in Revelation with soon. But seeing that connection to Daniel is important because it clues us into John's outlook as he writes the book. For John, the latter days in Daniel have swung into motion as he writes. The key has turned in the ignition. The engine of God's triumph is taking over. The last days began when Christ rose from the dead. And the last days will conclude when he comes again. So we are living in the last days and Revelation deals with life between those two poles, the empty tomb, and his second coming. And it's about what must take place in the latter days, the days in which we live. So of course they take place, as John says, quickly or the time is near. The reality is that the burden of the book of Revelation have been soon expected for the whole church in every generation since the tomb was found empty the first Easter Sunday. Every generation since we await the Lord's imminent return. My parents used to tell me about how they were sure that the Lord's coming was going to be that week during the Second World War because it was so terrible to live through those days. I can remember my father and mother saying that they were convinced that the time was near. And if you think about it, and then you put that into different generations, faithful Christians of every generation have always been aware that we live in the last days. We do not need to convince ourselves is um, around the court, you know, it's just around the corner for Revelation to speak with immediacy and relevance to our situation today. It was not written for the church down the line, it's written for the church of the last days in which we live. And notice in verse 2, the book is the careful eyewitness account of John to the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. 
So that's what we have in Revelation, not the inventions of John's fevered imagination. This isn't the first century equivalent of Alice in Wonderland. This is the Word of God and the testimony of Jesus. It's the Word of God, the testimony of Jesus. The authority of God attends Revelation. The voice of Jesus is heard in Revelation. So however difficult it may be to grasp, however obscure you may find it, given its burden to show us Jesus within our so which our souls so badly need, and given its relevance for the days in which we live, and given the fact that it's God himself and the voice of Christ, the witness of Christ addressing us, do you think that we can really neglect it and leave it unread? Dare we leave its pages closed and its images unexplored without damage to our spiritual welfare? So, but what happens when we begin to read? What happens when we given to read it? It's no surprise that its effect is sheer blessing. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So give yourself to Revelation. Read it each week. You will see Jesus. You will hear God. You will find yourself equipped and garrisoned against the enemy in these days. Bless him. That's what's on offer him. And of course what John says about Revelation in particular could equally be said about the whole Bible for sure. Read, hear, keep. The words of the book, blessing. And I think our souls are lean, starved of nourishment. The eyes of our faith see so little. Our spiritual courage fail us so often because of our neglect of the Bible, but yes, our neglect of Revelation. Read, hear, keep. Revelation is a word of blessing. Secondly, it's a word of grace. It's a word of blessing. It's a word of grace, verses 4 and 5. It's a letter to the seven churches. And so it follows the natural, normal letter writing conventions. It begins with grace, and, grace to you and peace. But as you well know, the New Testament uses those customary greeting words and transforms them to something else. They become words of benediction words of the promise of the gospel and I might conclude an email to you with I often do um, blessings James it's just the way I've always done it for the last 15 to 20 years I do it if I remember and because it's James's name that follows the wished for blessing immediately you recognize it for what it is it reflects my desire for your welfare but that's all it is. I haven't got any power to effect in your life the blessing that I wish for you. But when we hear these words, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, when we hear that the grace and peace is offered and promised by Father, Son and Spirit, well, we know that we're dealing with something altogether different from a casual and customary greeting. When the triune God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit speaks grace and peace, he alone is in a position to deliver what he promises. You see that? And the description of the Trinity is a wonderful description. It's one of the I think the most richest descriptions in the, in the Bible. God the Father, the one who was, who, who was and is and is to come. The unchanging, immutable God, sure and steadfast, utterly reliable. When he makes a promise, he's guaranteed by who he is. The seven spirits is a description of the Holy Spirit. Numbers in Revelation are extremely important, and number seven is probably the most important of all. It has that architect's role in structuring the whole book, because the seven parallel 
pictures, the seven churches, the seven seals, the seven trumpets, the seven bowls of wrath. And seven is the number of divine perfection. It's the perfect divine number. So the seven spirits are perhaps better translated the sevenfold spirit, the way to express divine perfection. So as the, bold as the book unfolds in these sequences of seven, the Holy Spirit is the sevenfold spirit in a way to say that the unfolding drama of God's purpose for the glory of the name of Jesus Christ only plays out under the activity and work of the Spirit of God. So he's before the throne, ready to do the will of the one who is seated and reigning. So we have who was and is and is to come. We have the sevenfold spirit and we have the faithful witness, Jesus Christ. And as, as you may know, the churches of Asia to which Revelation was written was enduring sharp persecution for their faith. There is a real cost to being followers of Jesus. They were learning firsthand. But there's grace and peace in Jesus Christ who is himself the faithful witness, faithful even unto death, and the victor over it. He's the firstborn from the dead and he's the ruler of kings of earth. Satan is defeated. As we will see in Revelation, he is bound. And the risen king is the ruler of the kings on earth. When the culture opposes the church as it did in John's day and as it does in our day, we can say very, very clearly it is easy to lose heart. It's easy to lose heart when, when, when Christian leaders fall, as we saw last year, or Christian leaders seem to stumble, or Christian leaders seem to compromise. It adds to the discouragement. It's easy to get discouraged. It's easy to say that the current gloom is only going to get darker. How can we ever stand firm against such rejection? John says, remember that Jesus himself is the faithful witness who endured even the death on the cross and the grave didn't hold him. The grave could not hold him. He rose and God has highly exalted him. And that's how we know that there is grace and peace for us in the midst of strife, suffering, pain and sorrow and loss, in the face of the contempt, in the face of the disdain of the unbelieving world. Because Jesus suffered and triumphed and he's the infallible, inerrant repository of every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places for suffering believers. So Revelation is a word of blessing. It's a word of grace. It's a word of praise, thirdly. Verses 5 to 8. Behold, he's coming with the clouds, verse 7. Every eye will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him, even so. Amen. Jesus is coming back. Every eye will see him, even those who persecuted him even those who oppose him. He will settle accounts. He will judge the world in righteousness, which means that time is short. And if you do not know Jesus Christ, he will come as a thief in the night when you are not looking for him. He will come unexpectedly. No one knows the day, no one knows the hour. Will you be ready when he comes? Now John, began thinking about the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ and his reign in the first part of verse 5. And here we are in verse 7, thinking about Christ's return to judge the world. And in between those two poles, those two statements about Jesus, life, death and resurrection, his second coming, John bursts into song. To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. You can hear him singing. I can. It's a doxology. It's praise for King Jesus. And look at what he says when he sings. He joins the dots. From Jesus' work in the first part, part of verse 5, the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, reigning over the world, to the second half of verse 5. 
He loves us, freed us from our sin, made us a kingdom and priests to give God glory. The work of Christ at the cross, the benefits he won by his blood, forgiveness of sin, eternal life, a new role as servants of God in the world. And one day, Jesus will come back to tie up the loose ends, to make everything crooked straight and to execute justice in the world. And as John takes that in from the cradle and the cross all the way to the empty tomb, to the heavenly throne, and lives changed by the gospel, and Christ split in the skies to come and judge the living and the dead. When John sees that, what does he do? He sings. He sings. You can't blame him. To him who loved us, to him be glory forever and ever. Amen. And one of the features of Revelation is that it's full of song. Songs of angels and elders and of the church triumphant. Songs of lament. Songs of praise. Songs in heaven. Songs on earth. It's full of song. So Revelation, the book of Revelation, the revelation of Jesus Christ, wants us to lift our eyes to the throne room in the midst of the worst of our trials. So that with John, with the saints in glory, with those who've gone before, with the angels, our mouths, might fill with doxology today as we see Jesus and be reminded of all that he has done. And we can sing to him who has loved us and freed us from our sin by his blood. To him be glory forever. Amen. And that was the experience of the first believers, the first Christians in the midst of their own suffering. Acts 16, Paul and Silas, you know the story, they're thrown into prison, it's midnight. What are they doing? They're singing hymns. The singing hymns. The church has always been a hymn singing church, hasn't it? In prison, out in, in the church, in the streets, adoring God in the midst of their suffering. I wonder what the other prisoners thought. They, Luke says they were listening. Why are you singing? What are you doing? Why are you singing? What have you got to sing about? It defies the logic of the world. Nothing in my circumstances would be a believer's art. Loved ones are hurting. There is sickness, there's loss, there's grief, there's pain. There's opposition, there's conflict. I may have nothing going for me on this earth. Nothing at all. Disadvantage every way I look. Little to commend me to the great and the powerful. But I can see what the world cannot see. Behold a throne and one seated on it. I can see Jesus reigning. I can see Jesus coming in glory. We believers can see the end of the story. I know how it ends. Whatever my present circumstances might be, I know how it ends because my Redeemer reigns to him be the glory forever and ever. So fill your vision with a large view of Jesus Christ. Linger on his obedience, his suffering, his cross, his resurrection, his exaltation. Think about him ever living to make intercession. Think about his reign over all things. And anticipate his coming again. And hasten that day with prayer, service and witness to him who loved me and by his own blood has set me free from my sin made me a child and a servant of the great God. May all the glory be his forever. And finally, it's a word of encouragement, verses 9 to 11. These are words of remarkable pastoral tenderness in the book of Revelation. As John, o, as John adds to note his own biographical aside, he's in exile on Patmos. He was in the Spirit. The Spirit inspired and enabled him to hear, understand and write on the Lord's Day, as he's commissioned to write and send to the churches. But why is he in exile? Your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus was on the island of Patmos on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. He's saying, I'm enduring the same kind of suffering that many of you to whom I write are experiencing. I am one of you. John is one of us. Revelation was not written from a distance, but from the realities 
of a normal existence. It was written by John, your brother and partner in the tribulation, but our brother in the kingdom and endurance that is in Christ. And that is the key, it's all in Jesus. John models for us the grace to keep going is in Jesus. And John is saying, I am the proof, I am the evidence that the blessing and the grace on offer is real and sure. It works in the reality of the worst kind of suffering. He is a living proof. So let the voice of this exile, this man in prison, if you like, on Patmos, encourage you, encourage you this afternoon to take God at his word in the trials of your own circumstances. And as we begin to read Revelation together, I, my prayer is that you find in Jesus Christ great blessing, abundant grace, unceasing fuel for praise and encouragement. May the Lord bless his word to us. Amen.